Ahoy hoy, this is Michaela from Team Retro, where we like retro games and we like the devices that bring them to us. I wasn't going to buy an RP3. I told myself that I wasn't going to buy an RP3. Guess what I ended up doing? I bought an RP3, also known as the Retroid Pocket 3. And things have been a little bit crazy in my personal life the last couple of weeks, so I didn't have a lot of time to play with this device, mostly because I was using whatever little time I had to finish up my work on the Ambernick Win 600. And so now that that's wrapped up, and I finally had a week to start setting this device up, I figured I would start with an initial impressions video as well as a setup tutorial. So my goal here is to just get you from initial setup to gaming in a matter of a half an hour or so. And hopefully by the time you've finished watching this video, you'll have all the tools you'll need to at least start playing games on your device. So with that, let's jump in and let's get to work. All right, let's start with an unboxing here. I got this device direct from Retroid for about $139, and I did opt for getting the model with three gigabytes of RAM. One thing I do have to say about Retroid, they do a very decent job in packaging their products. And this device is unusual in the fact that it actually comes with some daughter boards, a screw kit, and some buttons, another D-pad, and membranes in case you want to swap out the default button setup for more of a classic membrane setup. Now, I listened to the Retroid Handhelds podcast where Thor and Stubbs did this button swap out and it sounded like a pain in the neck, so I'm probably not going to do it. I also bought a carrying case and this is what it's going to look like. They give you a screen protector if you buy the carrying case, but other than that, it kind of looks like a Switch Lite case, only a little bit smaller because the RP3 is smaller than a Switch Lite. And it looks decent enough, no complaints here, it'll hold the RP3 pretty decently. Okay, now let's get to the main event, our box in a box. This is where the actual Retroid Pocket 3 is housed. I do have to admit here, box quality is pretty good. This looks like a premium device. Or rather, I should say a premium package device. So let's go ahead and get this opened. I'm just using my trusty knife to cut the tape. I think I accidentally cut a little bit of the box there, but not the unit itself, thankfully. And we're just going to open this up and we're going to pull this unit out. And I could see in the box they sent me a second screen protector, which is good because I'm notoriously terrible for putting screen protectors on. So at least this gives me a second chance if I screw up the first time. So here I have the device itself, the screen protector, as well as a charging wire and a user's manual. And obviously this charges by USB-C. Surprisingly enough, no charging brick, just the cable, which I guess is fine. They're selling this device as a budget-friendly device, so I could kind of understand not wanting to put that charging brick in. And just a couple of quick impressions on the device itself. It is smaller than I expected, and it is actually more comfortable to hold than the Retroid Pocket 2. But it's got the flat form factor of a Nintendo Switch, which I am actually not a fan of. I've become very much spoiled by grips on the bottom. Retroid opted for a plastic cover on the memory card slot as opposed to a soft cover. And speakers this time are on the bottom back of the device as opposed to the front of the device. There's also some cutouts on the back for ventilation, and oddly enough, the start and select buttons are on the top of the device, not on the face of the device, which is a very unusual design choice, especially considering I found myself having to tilt the unit to press those buttons, which kind of broke my immersion while playing. 
but I didn't find it to be a deal breaker at all. This is definitely an improvement over the Retroid Pocket 2 and the 2 Plus. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a tutorial on how to put the screen protector on. I was going to originally do a screen protector tutorial at some point in the future, but I ended up realizing that I'm notoriously bad for putting on screen protectors. And I'm actually really glad that Retroid sent me two because I definitely screwed up the first placement like I knew I was going to. So I needed to utilize that second screen protector. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to link to Retro Game Core's tutorial on how to use the hinge method to put on a screen protector. And I'm going to let him teach you instead because he actually does a much better job at screen protector placement than I do. I'm the weird guy who has to go to that kiosk in the mall to have screen protectors put on because I'm just horrible at it. But miraculously, the second time around, I did actually get the screen protector on to a point where I was satisfied with it. So I'm actually really glad that I don't have to do without. All right, let's get this bad boy turned on. Now you will be greeted with an introduction video very similar to the one at the beginning of Donkey Kong Country that the Rare Company made. And this device does ship with Android 11, so you are going to get a controller-friendly Android setup guide here at the beginning. And I'm not really going to show you that process. I'm going to kind of rush through it. You're just going to select your language, pick your Wi-Fi, and then at some point in the process, you are going to have the option to pre-install apps. I only recommend pre-installing a couple of them. Do the... Dolphin MMJR, the Citra Enhanced, and you could download the PS2 one if you want just because it'll be more optimized for this device, but I don't know that I really expect PS2 performance out of the Retroid Pocket 3. Everything else, just get it from the Play Store because then you'll be able to keep up with updates. And we're going to go ahead and select the AOSP launcher just for now. We are going to switch to the Retroid Pocket launcher later. And here's what the home screen looks like. I'm going to turn up the brightness just a little bit because now we're not dealing with all that white on the screen and you could get a better look at the device itself. But you can see all the pre-installed apps as well as the default apps are sitting on the home screen. So what I like to do here is condense everything into one home screen. So I'll take all of the bloatware and I'll just throw it into a folder named utilities. And then I'll make a folder for emulators, a folder for launchers. And then I will keep some apps on the front of the device like Chrome and the like that I'm going to be accessing on the regular. And then the next step is to go ahead and sign into the Play Store and we're going to start downloading our apps. We'll get our Android games if we have them, our emulators, and whatever other apps that we feel that we are going to use on this device. Now if you've never had an Android device before and you're going to be using this device only for emulation, then I actually made this handy dandy infograph for you. These are all of the emulators and systems that are going to run really well on this device. And there's going to be a couple of other emulators that you can use, such as Dolphin and Citra that we installed in the pre-install apps portion. But your mileage is going to definitely vary with those, and you're probably not going to get great performance. But these systems you see here on the screen, these are going to play very well. And here's just a sample of what the home screen looks like with everything installed. So we're just going to go ahead and take this 128 gigabyte SanDisk card and we're going to put this in the memory card slot and we're going to set this up for emulation. And once you put the memory card in, it will get recognized by the system and you could swipe down from the notification center at the top to set it up. Now you have two options here. You can use the SD card for handheld storage or portable storage. If you use it for handheld storage, you could put Android apps on it, but 
you will never be able to take the SD card out. So I would actually prefer, since we're going to use this with ROMs, to set this up as portable storage so I can take the SD card out and put it in my computer. I don't necessarily plan on putting many Android games on this device anyway, and the ones I do plan on putting on will fit in the Retroid Pocket's built-in storage. So let's go ahead now and boot into the Retroid Pocket 3 launcher, and you'll see here it's actually very empty. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna switch over to emulation, and again, it's going to look empty because we haven't set up any systems. So let's click Setup and Create ROM Folders. It will then ask if you want to use the root directory or the SD card directory. Go ahead and click SD card directory and that's it. It'll automatically create our ROM folders for us and we can actually eject this SD card and put it in our computer. Now here at our computer, you'll notice that the USB drive has been populated by a bunch of Android folders, but also this folder called Retroid Pocket Games. And if we go into this folder, you'll notice there's a section for our BIOS files. I've already pre-populated it with all of the BIOS files I have in my system. And there's a section for ROMs, and it's already been set up with folders for each system. So you'll put your ROM files in the appropriate folder for the system those ROMs are meant to run on. Now, if you don't have access to any BIOS files or ROM files, unfortunately, I can't tell you where to get them. But for BIOS files, look up RetroArch BIOS Pack and you should get what you need. And ROM files, you are 100% on your own to look for. And if you have an existing ROM library already, you can just use this SD card on your computer and you can manually transfer the ROM files over. But if you also want to look for ROM files on the internet and you don't necessarily have access to a computer, you can do this on the Retroid Pocket 3 itself using the Chrome browser. Either way, once you have your ROM library ready to go and your BIOS files in place, we can move on to the next step of this guide. So the SD card is back in place in the Retroid Pocket 3, and we're going to boot right back into the Retroid Launcher. So the next step in this guide would be to get the launcher to recognize our ROM files and to set them up. Now if you go into the top left here, there's a section to change the icon that goes with this system. You could put a name up here. And you can also change to dark mode, which I'm going to do now to make things easier for us to see in this video. Now let's go ahead and click on systems. And it's going to give you a very long, extensive list of all of the systems that are possible to emulate on this device, for better or for worse. So just go ahead and go down that list and check off the ones that you actually want to see on this menu. And then when you have all the systems checked off that you want to play, then go ahead and click OK. And you'll notice that the device will populate with pictures of all the systems. It'll look kind of like a Nintendo Switch, and it does look kind of nice. I do really enjoy this theme. Now let's set up one of the systems. I'm actually going to start with Game Boy Advance. And you're going to have to do this for every single system, but I'm going to show you how to do it once with Game Boy Advance, and then we're going to go from there. So in this section, you want to go ahead and click ROMs. Under Set Game Path, go ahead and click Add. And then just click Default SD Card Directory, and then click Scan. You may get one of these warning notices. Just go ahead and click OK. And it's actually going to scan and populate the Game Boy Advance section with only the Game Boy Advance games. And this is a lot more streamlined than it has been in the past with Retroid systems. And another new feature of this launcher, if you click the View tab, you can change things so that it looks more like an emulation station setup where you have the titles of the games on the left and the box art on the right. And this is actually what I prefer when I look at front ends. Now let's stop at Kirby and the Amazing Mirror because you'll notice that for the box art, it pulled the Japanese box art instead of the US box art. And if you're okay with that, that's fine. But I'm going to show you how to change the box art if the scraper doesn't pull it or doesn't pull the right one. 
And you'll do that by holding down on the game title and selecting box cover. And you can try the game's DB and it may give you this warning. Just go ahead and click OK. And it'll take you to the website, the game's DB. And you might not necessarily get what you're expecting. Like here, there actually isn't any box art for our search. So we're going to go ahead and go back to the launcher. And instead, we're going to click box cover again and then Google images. And from there, it's going to pull up an image search. And sure enough, we're getting our US box art here. So I just click on any one of the images I want to use and then hold down on the image that comes up and click download image. Now, this will populate your downloads folder. So just expect it to be full of images by time you're done. And then if we go ahead and head back to our launcher, it's going to automatically populate the box art with the new image. So as you're going through your systems and scraping and uploading your ROMs to this launcher, you will have to go through them. And if there's a box art that doesn't seem right, that's how you'll go ahead and fix it. Now, if you go into the edit section, this is where you can actually change the emulator that the game launches. So I prefer MGBA, so I'm going to use the drop down menu to switch to MGBA, then click save and cancel. And you'll notice here that when I tried to launch the game, it actually failed, even though I had RetroArch installed. So what you're actually going to do here is try to load up a game. And if it says launch or fail, hit OK, and it'll take you to the Play Store to find the correct emulator, in which case we're actually going to download RetroArch Plus right from the Play Store. And then once it's downloaded, we're going to go ahead and launch it. And it's going to automatically tell us that we'll need to use the online updater. So go ahead and go into the online updater. And then once we get there, there's going to be a whole bunch of options for things we can update. Just go ahead and download them all. The core info files, the assets, the controller profiles, the cheats and the databases, overlays and GLSL shaders. Just go ahead and download all of them. It'll take a few minutes for that to work out. And then once it's done, go ahead and quit RetroArch and relaunch it. Then go back into that online updater and go to core downloader. And this is where you could scroll down and download all your cores for all these systems that you want to emulate. And the list of cores is going to be pretty extensive, but only download the cores for the systems that you actually are planning on using. For me, I'm downloading most of the Nintendo systems as well as some of the Sega systems as well. And this next step is personal preference, but I'm going to go into the settings and I'm going to go into the driver section and I'm going to change the menu to XMB. That's just a personal preference for me because I don't like the way this current default menu looks. And then I'm going to go into configuration file and save current configuration. And then I can quit RetroArch from there. Now, when I relaunch the program, I'll have this nice little PSP, PS3 type menu. And I just find this a lot easier to navigate than the default menu that comes with RetroArch. Now I'm going to go in and set my hotkeys. So we're going to go into settings and then we're going to scroll down to input and then we're going to scroll down again to hotkeys. And once we get into that menu, I'm going to set hotkey enable to L3 only because the start and select buttons are on the top. And then I'm just going to scroll down and pick the buttons I want to trigger a certain retro arc action, such as fast forward, load state, save state, or quit retro arc. And I am going to set quit retro arc to R3 instead of start for the same reason as I set the hotkey to select. So now when I hold L3 and another button, it's going to trigger the retro arc function that I want to trigger at that moment. The only advice I'm going to give is one, 
check out Retro Game Core's written guide for an example of how to set up your hotkeys. I'll leave a link in the video description. And two, do not set a hotkey to the A button. This version of RetroArch is currently bugged, and if you set a hotkey to the A button, you will 100% lose all functionality of the A button. So just go ahead and avoid that until they fix it. Then when everything's all set up, go to configuration file and save current configuration. And then you can close out of RetroArch yet again. Now, when you go to start up a game, you'll see that the game opens in the correct emulator, loads the correct core and starts you all up. But you'll see that the touch screen buttons are still there. So we'll need to go into the RetroArch menu to fix that. And all you have to do is go to on screen overlay and make sure you turn on hide overlay when controller is connected. And now you should be good to go. You'll see that all you see is the game and no controls. Now here's another optional setup step, but if you aren't comfortable with using A for jump and B for run in some platform games like Super Mario, you can actually go into the quick menu and you can go to controls. Then if you go to port one controls, Set the A button to Turbo A, set the B button to A, set the Y button to B, and set the X button to Turbo B. Then when you're done, you can either save game remap file for just that particular game, or content directory remap file if you want to save it for every Game Boy Advance game, NES game, or whatever system you are changing the remap for. And what that's going to do is for these systems that only have two face buttons, it's going to set it up more like a Super Nintendo controller, and it's going to make things a little bit easier to control as far as running and jumping in something, say, like a Mario game. So now, as you can see here, we finally have Game Boy Advance up and running. And I have to say, on this device, because it is a smaller device, Game Boy Advance looks really good on it. There are black borders on the left and right, like there usually are with 16x9 screens, but there are barely noticeable, and it does look really nice. I know this is only an initial impressions video, but I do have to say that the screen does look really good on this device. It's just very bright and crisp. Now, Mupin64 Plus is another emulator that we need to configure out of the gate. So let's start by going into settings and then let's go into controller. Then we're going to go to Android Gamepad. And then from there, we're going to click on it. And then we're going to go ahead and click copy because we are going to have to set up a new controller profile. So I'm going to go ahead and name it Retroid. And then once I've done that, it's going to come up with a screen that shows every single controller button on an N64. So we need to click on each one of these and then we need to click unmap and then actually remap it to what button we want it to be on the Retroid Pocket. And this will take a couple of minutes, just unmap and then remap, unmap and remap, scroll up if you made a mistake and redo it. And the other thing you're probably going to want to do is you're going to want to set up a hotkey to bring up the menu. In this case, I set it to be L2. And then when you're done, you can exit out of the setup and you'll see that the new controller profile that we named Retroid is there and is available for us to now use. Now let's back out to the menu and we're going to go to select profiles and under controller one profile, we're gonna go ahead and change that to Retroid. And now our controller scheme is going to work just fine. And I was pawing through the settings when getting this video ready, and I noticed that this particular build of Mupin 64 Plus FZ was already set to a 480p resolution. So right out of the box on this device, Nintendo 64 should be running at a 2x resolution and you should be getting a pretty crisp image especially on a small screen like this i never thought i would be okay with a smaller 16 by 9 screen but it actually makes everything crisp and bright and makes me want to play on this smaller pocketable device 
So you'll want to go through your standalone emulators and make sure your buttons are mapped appropriately, but you also want to make sure you have some way of accessing the menu that isn't the touchscreen. Here in PPSSPP, I'm mapping the pause button to L2, and every time I need to get into the menu when I'm playing PSP games, all I have to do is hit L2 and I'll be able to jump right from the game into the PPSSPP menu to save states or exit. And PSP is a 16x9 system, so here we are running Mega Man powered up with a 2x resolution. And because the Retroid Pocket 3 is a small 16x9 screen, PSP games actually look really good on it. And they get to take up the entire screen too, which is great. Now the only other emulator we need to take time to really set up is Drastic and we need to do a couple of things here. First thing we need to do is we need to go into the menu and we need to change the orientation of the screen. So I'm going to choose the landscape X by 1 and that will give priority to the top screen. And then I'm going to go down and go to Edit Screens and Virtual Pad, and then I'm going to pick that X by 1 layout. And from here, we can actually resize the screens, and we can move things around, and we can set them up however we want. I like to keep the bottom screen on the right on a device like this slightly smaller than the big screen on the left, which is going to be our primary screen. And now I'm going to hit menu and save as global layout. And then if you take a look, you'll notice that you still have a decent view of the right screen, but that left screen is going to take priority. And then from there, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go into options and external controller. And we're going to go to select key mapping. And then click one of the areas that says no mapping. And then from there, we can go ahead and map control and just go through and press the appropriate keys. And then when we're done, we're actually going to go back in and select a couple of hotkeys. So now we're going to go ahead and hit map special. And I'm going to skip a lot of the mappings, but what I am going to do is set L2 to open menu and I'm going to set R3 as pointer down. And then the last thing I'm going to do to configure Drastic is I'm going to set the right stick mode to pointer mode. So now I'll have the option of using the touch screen to access the bottom screen controls, but I can also use the right analog stick as a mouse and use that as an alternative option to using the touch screen if I choose. And Android is one of those operating systems that DS games run really well on because you can see both screens and if you have a touch screen you can utilize it. And you can also upscale the resolution so that the games look crisper than they did on an actual DS system. One last setting I recommend is go into the settings and go down to the display area and scroll down to where it says advanced. And then under screen timeout, change that to 30 minutes. You want to do that because you don't want your system to prematurely go into sleep mode if you need to put the game down for a minute. and will at least get you to the point where you can start playing and enjoying your games. So that'll do it for this video. Hopefully this helped you set up your Retroid Pocket 3, and hopefully by the time you got to the end, you were playing and enjoying some retro games on this device. And look forward to a full in-depth review on the Retroid Pocket 3 coming soon, once I've had more time to play around with it. And let me know your thoughts on this device in the comments below, and let me know what you would like to see in that final review. But again, thank you so much for watching, and if this video was helpful to you in any way, please be sure to like and subscribe. 
Until next time, bye for now, and don't stop believing.